Welcome to everyone to the Revenue Insights podcast, joined by myself, uh, Tony, wonderful head of RevOps here at EBSA. And this week, we're joined by Michael Boardman, who is the uh, Director of Revenue Operations at Castellan. Have I pronounced that correctly? Castellan, yep. Castellan. No, okay. Wonderful. Um, Michael, we've already been having a bit of fun, like before the show, getting to know a little bit more about yourself. Um, but for the context of of our audience listening, can you tell us a little bit more about your journey to to get into where you are today? Sure. So it, it all started. I mean, it's a little over ten years ago. I went to university out in Colorado, and I got into a a development program with a company called EMC. They bring in about 10 people a year. And, and for me, it was in the business operations, but there was a finance, there was an engineering, there was all sorts of different development programs. And that's where I got my start. And all things considered, where you learn things, you learn Excel there, you learn basic analysis at that point. And it just gave you a really good skill set. So I, I jumped around at EMC for a bunch of years and then moved, in, uh, moved into more of a SaaS-based business for, for several others. But I remember at one point in my career, it was, it was a switch where sales ops was really becoming a bigger thing, right? And what the key difference was, I went to a, a great company who me in and they had, their, they had their machine built at that point. And I remember talking to my brother way back when in 2014, 2015, thinking about, I want to go with a company that's ready to grow, right? And the machine had already been built. Like, I want to go build it because I got so sick of being an analyst and like fixing data on the back end. I want to go fix that at the source. So moved my way over to a much smaller company, uh, Crimson, and then started getting into consulting. And consulting was really great because you got so many at bats and going through this sales ops journey, sales ops becoming rev ops, and then I uh, got lucky enough to get picked up by a client, and that's why my cast on. So quite a long journey, but analyst into operations, into consulting, back into sort of full time operations. Amazing. Um, I actually do have a question on the back of this. So I was looking at yeah, the background. Um, so obviously, huge fan of the, the pathway that it is that you've taken. So there's economics in there, there's analytics in there. It's all about patterns. It's all about predictions. Like you come from that world, and like you say, you were at that back end, and then you started kind of going to that source. How would you say that that lens of analytics and those foundations that you got? How would you say that that's kind of impacted the way that you operate now within revenue operations? So I, I always go back to, when you say patterns, I go through my favorite classes when I went, was in school and I noticed a couple of things. Like I went to go to school to do engineering and I didn't end up an engineer. So this seemed to be the next best thing, right? Yeah. And so the pattern recognition was always there. I was always good at math. Um, so my stats class really, they really just made sense to me. And then I have like only a couple A's in college. One was like coding, another one was photography, and another one was architecture. And so if you think of RevOps, it's kind of like piecing that together with some statistics. You have to design things basically from scratch. And then photography is seeing what you can work with, right? So it was one of those things that just, as I realized and I got further and further into my career, I actually had some of the basic skill sets going through college that then was able to take it through. Um, but some of the basics, I mean, you got to be a good analyst at the end of the day or a good structural person when it comes to technology. So those are some of the things that kind of came through my background. How do you find that? Um, how do you find that kind of tran- transitions into your role now? Because so I'm coming at, it, at this from like a marketing perspective, right? So I'm, I'm used to all of like the data and the analysis and everything. And something that I picked up on was kind of at the companies that you've worked at previously, like at Crimson, your background is very much in kind of the, the sales space. So sales... Sure. From, from my perception anyway, is typically, you know, less analytical by that stage. It's becoming increasing so now. So how how do you kind of see that starting to apply to, I guess, sales in, in particular? Yeah, I think it really comes down to, you got to start talking about data. And like, I always have to go into data first because it all starts with sales because sales usually needs to move quickly. And I think that was the birth of sales ops, right? Way back in the day, you didn't need to have a huge CRM or base back in technology. You needed something that can move quick with the sales team. As we've moved quicker and quicker, think of the tech stack that's been growing in the last four or five years, right? We started with the marketing tech stack. We've now moved into sales tech stack. We're now moving to customer success. And like it's now moving out to even people like me, right? There's now tools for me, which is great. Um, But when it comes to it, like how has those things changed it really starts going back to data and how many data points have been created. 
We now have CRMs that actually create a lot of information. We now have all the automation you can imagine to get unstructured data back into your CRM to then analyze back. You have sales automation tools, marketing automation tools. And so that's how it's kind of growing is RevOps has kind of followed the data a little bit. And that's why it started with sales is because we put so much focus there. But now it's creeping up into the bigger RevOps portfolio. And how I usually think of it from RevOps is from marketing through sales to to customer success or retention, and then north-south from finance to support. And yes, it could branch off in a bunch of other different directions, but when you think of it, it it all starts with where the data is, and therefore it usually started with a forecast because that's the first key, like the, the, the keyhole that you need to start with because that's where the data then builds off of. Nice. And so how is it, uh, with where you are now, how is that revenue team structured? You've kind of covered it quite nicely um, um, uh, visually there. So how does it look like from, I guess, the team that you've got at the minute? And also, how did you get there in terms of building that out? Yeah, so one, I, I kind of fell into it here, which has been great. Uh, we have, a, we have a, a mixed team at Castellon right now. We have a really strong marketing operations person, um, our old our director of customer success is also an operational S person. Uh, our support team already had an operations person. And then I have um, two contracted resources, managed Salesforce. And then we have an, another colleague of mine is in, uh, is in more of the change management space. So we, we kind of do a tag team RevOps here that there's, there's not a large team. And then more recently had an analyst join the team. So it's, it's a little bit more of a, of a shared platform, but the reason why it works for us here is everyone's really good at their thing, right? And we're able to share our resources versus focusing on, hey, that's mine, that's yours. It's like, no, we're good. Where do, you, where do I report? Where do you report? And then we kind of cut that over as needed. So here, it's, I think it's a little bit different than most traditional, like I have a Salesforce admin or I have an operations manager or you have a um, sometimes a deal desk as person and an analyst. For us, it's, it's a little more of a shared shared group and it, it does work for us. With them, um, so you've got many different kind of stakeholders, like you said, that are really key. They're, they're at the top of their game within that function and kind of everyone can share out things. How would you, like say you're going into an organization and, and you might have previously been in there where you've gone in, you've you've built that, that infrastructure, you've got the logic, you know what it is that you're going after and, and looking for and what it is that you need to do. How would you, I suppose, look to motivate the sales teams around you or even, like you said, the CS, how would you motivate the teams around you that are not necessarily interested in the same things or have the same motivations as you? Like, how, how do you go about that? It's easier said than done, but you've got to get some wins, right? you got to, like, as much as you want to go in on day one and say, change your entire process or change your entire flow, you are the, usually the new person. And that is one of the hardest things to go in that you know what to do. And the key for me is, is getting quick wins, right? We, the one thing about consulting and when I was at scale up was really focusing on value and impact, right? And trying to ranking those as much as possible. Most of your customers right off the bat are usually on the management team. That being said, you're not, you're not looking past the sales team. Like at all, or anyone in customer success, or anyone in support, it's just you got to get a couple of wins because you got to build trust and work your way through. And so, when I think of getting wins at the sales, focus on something that's helpful for them. What is the biggest pain point in their day? If you really start ranking it, sometimes it's not the biggest thing that you need to focus on tomorrow, right? But it is something that gets you a quick win, and then you try to just get the ball moving and focus in on how many more quick wins can I get to get trust from different team members because then. By the time you work on your project plan, a couple of weeks, months, sometimes years later, by the time you get back, you now have a group of advisors that's naturally built because you've helped them on, on some of the smaller projects from the grander picture, but big issues that they need to solve and they want to solve because it's really a pain in their, in their side every day. Uh, um, to, to, to follow up on that point, um, for, for you going into that role, what were some of your quick wins, uh, you know, that really got you off the ground? So the first, at least at Castellon, the biggest one was we had an integration. We bought a company in April 20, 2020. It was right after COVID. So my quick win was integrating that company and combining processes. So that's the quick win. Can we see the entire company in one pane of glass? That was the, that was the biggest win. 
Uh, there were a couple small tools, the little tool tuck-ins that we did just to try to get things easier. Um, and then really focusing on the forecast. Um, at that point, I was our CEO was our acting sales leader, so spending a lot of time with them. So most of my wins were around metrics because at that point, between roughly April when I came in full-time um, to the fall, we now had accrued enough data to then show, here's what we're measuring. And that's where the metrics come in. That's where the forecast comes into place. So um, my quick win there was uh, was integration and we had a combined processes. So I got lucky a little bit on that one, at least this, at this round. And um, and in addition to that, how, how, how mature was like the, the operations function when you first joined? Was it kind of to, to the point that you kind of made, was it kind of set up for that, you know, that, that the easy quick win? Or was it very much, it was kind of at its infancy and you've grown from there? So Castellan was, was a little bit different that it, it didn't come from one, one company. It was a combination of three companies come together. So there was not a ton of infrastructure built because we had to go integrate basically all three from scratch. So when we think about our data, it was a couple of years old. Um, we, we had to go back and rewrite some data back to, a, from a, to an earlier time period and snap it off. Um, so there were some basic things, right? We had a CRM in place. We had some basic tools in place. Um, I had been involved a little bit earlier on a consulting project to get some of the BDRs involved. Um, but like, what you didn't have everything, right? You had some technical, some tech debt in, and that was part of our journey, right? There were several of us that came in roughly in 2020 to, to, to go through this journey of, of bringing all three companies together, setting up process, setting up structure. And I think that's why the group is still a little hodgepodge because that's, we all kind of came in it from a different angle and then RevOps kind of was the, was the linchpin altogether. But we had a lot of shrunk people along the way bringing it all together. So um, there, was, there were some people and they were, getting, they were joining us as I was joining as well. Nice. It's, it's, it's really interesting, like bringing the three companies together all into one. Because um, what we find a lot when kind of talking to companies is, you know, for, for RevOps function, it's a, a big question around getting buy-in, um, particularly from, you know, the sales team and, and, and wider than that, you know, customer success team, so on and so forth. So for from the three, was it already kind of, those teams were already bought, bought into it? You know, this is how the, our world works and we already have that alignment? It was, it, it was truly a convergence, right? There was company number one, Assurance, had a lot, like they had all the contracts and the basic infrastructure and then we were focused on them from, let's say, a traditional BDR function. Clearly, you had a lot of transactions um, per, per month, per quarter, which for me is the data side. And then ultimately, Evolution, which is the third company that came in, they just had a lot of information, right? They had a lot more leads and that's where the marketing function kind of was built off from or, or rebuilt off from. So it was... It was truly, we kind of took the best of all three um, and combined them all into the new cast one process, processes. Mm. How interesting. Nice. That, that must um, have been very fun. <laughs> what was that, Tony? I said, how interesting having to, like, you, you pull all three in, but taking the elements of each that, that it is that work, that's, that must have been real fun to do. Yeah, it was a busy summer, that's for sure. <laughs> And then it ended with a with a brand launch later in that summer. So mm. it was a it was a busy summer. But to to bring us back from the fourth wall. So um, within your um, within sales in particular, um, we kind of touched on it a little bit already. How for for, for you guys, and we've touched on it a little bit already. So was a lot of that analytics already kind of set up and, and, and in place? Um, or was it a case of, it oh God, we need, we need that data so actually we can start to run the analysis afterwards? We needed, yeah, we needed to create it. And that's, when I start thinking about setting these up, right? And whether it's cash flow and combining three companies or going into a new one, you got to start with what you need to measure. And so one, I have a, a couple right off the bat, and I'm talking about SaaS B2B here, right? Average deal size, how long is your sales cycle, how many ops you create, um, and I always forget, um, sales cycle, pipeline value, like all the big ones that you hear. And I think there's, I know there's a book out there like SAS metrics, right? So you got to start collecting that information and that you need to start that early without really telling anyone. But in reality, you're starting, you're going to the forecast. You always got to go to the forecast because that's going to tell you where to go next. 
So you, you ask the basic, how long does it take to, to pull a forecast? Is your forecast accurate? Are people have deals in the right stages? Do we know if, do we know how we're going to perform this quarter? And depending on where you go from there, you then can branch out. So those are usually the key metrics that you need to come in with, knowing you need to get to. So you put in your little processes and make sure you can start collecting that data. Meanwhile, you're moving towards the forecast as fast as possible because that's then going to tell you where to go next. Because once your forecast is, st- is stabilized and you at least know you're collecting information consistently, well, do you have a lead flow pro- problem, right? Or pipeline problem? You're going to go towards marketing, towards marketing, towards pipeline development, towards prospecting. If you're going the other way, do you have a do you have too many customers coming in? Therefore, you have a customer success challenge that you can go through. And can you support those customers and onboarding and all the other stuff? Do you have a billing issue, right? Do we know how much is in the bank? Okay, now you have a billing issue. And so starting with the forecast, that's where you start branching out. But meanwhile, you're collecting a ton of data along the way, knowing in a few months' time, you're then going to have to measure it back. How do we perform this quarter, this month, this year, depending on the business? It's all going to go to there. So usually what I come in... Usually at the start of the year, I have roughly four to six months. That's usually about what it takes to build up enough data set because I know in October, I'm sorry, in August, most, at least in a traditional fiscal year, I need to start building up a couple of files. It's going to start planning and planning starts on September 1st. Yeah. Right. I need, because someone's going to ask me on September 1st or sometime, it's, where are we going to land next year? And now I have it four to six months. It may not be perfect, but I have enough to start making those true long-range forecast estimates, which then moves us usually into an analytical S conversation. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Um, breaking the floor. Am I here? Everyone can hear? Yeah. You're good. Cool. All good. Cool. Um, so obviously, Absa, we're we're forecasting everything and everything. Obviously, we speak to a lot of organizations that um, don't necessarily have the um, the nice to have tools that it is that you can kind of implement once you've got that buy-in around the business, around RevOps, all that sort of stuff. Um, for a lot of these tools to work, obviously, you have to have a great foundation within your CRM of what is built off. And then off the back of that, you have to have great methodology, understanding of sales stages and everything that kind of has to run all the way through. Um, if you were to give some advice to uh, an organization that just needs to kind of, one, get their CRM and their stages and their weightings all, all nice and, and, and correct, what would be the key data points that you would say, those are the ones that you want to focus on, those are the ones that it is that you want to absolutely sure. tick off with the, with the sales team for you to be able to forecast X? Yeah. And so the first, the first advice is go small, right? What are the like, and get down to five at most ten metrics that you care about, and then measure to it, right? So sales stage, how many deals have gone into the pipeline? You being one, and then if that's one, okay, then you have A, B, C, D. That's like how many deals going to stage one, two, three, four, five, and that's going to start building up a lot of data points uh, off the side. Um, you then move into average deal size. You just need a first count, right? Yeah. You just need to know what that's going to be. You need to know how many customers do you have. Right. Um, so, customers, average deal size, sales cycles is another one. Ops created, pipeline value. I think I got all five. Ops created. I always, I always miss one. Ops created, deal size, pipeline generated, and size um, added the pipeline, sales cycles. I think that's five. If I miscounted, I probably miscounted, but it's all no, around those things. No, customers, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah. And then you go into customers, right? Because for me, the, the, the companies that I love working with more and more are ones that have a lot of transactions because they've produced a lot of data. Yeah. No, makes makes total sense. Thanks. Thanks so much. Do you track sales velocity? I do. Okay. But it's, not one, it of, weird, but it's not one of the five. Uh, I do. Sorry. So I call that via sales cycles. But yes, okay. I do. Um. Now, I track it a little bit differently than most, right? Most people say, hey, how much time from stage to stage? Mm. Um, this is where we go back to stats. One of the hardest things about the average deal size is, if, let's say you say average sales cycle six months, but you have 50% of your deals close in the first six months, and then 50% of your deals close over the next two years, right? Your sales cycle is still six months. How are you supposed to forecast that? Mm-hmm. So we... we uh, it's always like the one thing that I have to put that one stat. My average sales cycle is this. Yeah. And, but we look at it from more of like a distribution curve. So think, go back, and this is where go back to your stats class 
for a second and start thinking of how much closes within a certain time period. And then you can, you can really build your models off that, right? Do you have a big, are you skewed left? Are you skewed right? And depending on that answer, it really can help you focus in on like, how long is my sales cycle for real? Because sometimes we get in a planning cycle and say, hey, my sales cycle is four, six, nine months. Okay, great. I've built enough pipeline. And then you can't figure out why you have, you built enough pipeline, but you're not closing enough. It's because some deals take two years, right? Even though you put six months in your sales cycle, there's too much skew over to the right. So when it comes to sales velocity, yes, I put that in my sales cycle bucket. And there's usually, okay, the big milestone and then the individual sales velocity, et cetera, items underneath. Cool. Something that before we kind of went, went down that rubber hole was kind of interesting to me. And I'm just going to ask it as a very like a blank question because I, I get the sense that you've, you'll have your own kind of approach to it. So how, uh, one of the big questions that um, we've kind of been thinking about a lot recently is how exactly do you improve the accuracy of your f- forecast? So I have a model that I've been working on for a bunch of years and it's taken on different lives. Um, so each month I go through a series of metrics to make sure that we are on track or off track to previous assumptions. So oh, the last one was conversion rates. I forgot conversion rates. Mm-hmm. So what I do is, is I'm running a forecast independently of sales leadership. And it's, it's really a tool at the end of the day. And for me, it's, it's, it's doing little tweaks, right? Did our sales cycle get shorter or velocity get shorter? Because our velocity gets shorter, I can now adjust a model just a, just a little bit to say, hey, I think we're going to close X in, 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 y, in Y quarter. So what I'm going through is I'm purposely going through the same metrics every month, every quarter, and then trying to find better ways and more accurate ways because one team might have a faster sales velocity and then one might have a, a lower conversion rate. And by tweaking these knobs, we can get cl- hopefully get closer and closer to a systematic forecast. So that's how I look at it from a standpoint. I just need the team to keep forecast, forecasting in a consistent way. And as long as they keep forecasting, hence why sales cycles and all the other the basics, if you will, need to be solidified months and years ago, because then you can start tweaking some of these models. And then you can start showing, hey, longer range forecast, not just a month or month or quarter, but hey, are we light and, or heavy in, in out years? And help build confidence in your sales leader's ability to, to call um, to call their forecast because they're going to still doing their same thing, right? Or whatever they've been doing for, for many years. Nice. So, so you've got obviously people at different levels making different forecast calls, which are obviously then rolling up into your CRO, I'm guessing. Um, Correct. Which is all ultimately helping you get closer towards that number. Interesting. So um, there's no actually no crossover really then from the, the forecast that calls that you're making with the calls that they are making as well. Is that correct? There's a little bit of crossover in a sense of like, I, I look at the deals and like I go down to each individual deal and try to forecast each deal on, on some sort of time frame. Um, but it so like there's the crossover, but they call a number and I call a number. And it's like the, the goal is that we converge through, through the course of the quarter. Mm, nice. And it works? Yeah, it works. I got thrown off last quarter. We had a big deal swing. Um, so it's been working for about a, about a year and a half. So it's always interesting. I get nervous right about now because we're about halfway through the quarter just to see where we're going to land. But um, yeah, it's been working. Um, but what it, it's now, it's now it's getting thrown off a little bit. So it's been fun to challenge it. And it's now like a running joke between the company to see who, who's going to be able to call it. <laughs> I don't think you ever win at that. <laughs> right? No, you lose every time. <laughs> <laughs> you lose every time. And I think that's the crazy part, right? And I think that's where when we get to any sort of strategic conversation, right? You in RevOps are always a, a, you're an assistant coach, right? Your job is to support whomever you need. And I think that's why sometimes it's tough, right? You want to go out there, but like, do you then want to carry the stress of going out there and being the, like, not, sometimes I'm good, right? Like, hey, I just want to give you little tidbits along the way and, and focus and here's how to drive the business. So. It's it's one of those things that at least the forecast model I use is is meant to to support some of the other trajectory or decisions and perhaps long term plans. Nice. Something that I was kind of f- f- from your perspective, you know, what what does the future hold now? Do you think it's been obviously an interesting journey for for you getting to where you are now? And by the sounds of it, your kind of your operations function is quite mature. So, 
what what does the yeah what does the future look like in I guess within Castellan and then also like broader within revenue operations? Yeah, so it usually takes me about a year or two. I always try to think these as, as they start as three year projects. The first year or two is setting up structure and process and getting those their first round of, of data out. And then you move into an analytics function, right? You, you start getting asked so many questions and you literally can't process enough information. Um, so that's usually where, at least for us, a BI provider starts coming into place of like, you start asking 10 questions and I answer 10 questions every month, but you're now starting the 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th question. And so we need to start operationalizing that. So that's where from a rev ops and at least from where we think of it, we think of it more so from, you have your operational world, right? I usually think of operational analytics. All of that structure goes usually into your CRM, right? It goes into your basic processes and th- those are the things that you need to have, right? You then move into sort of the analytical S function, right? This is one-time exercise needs like things you need to do for planning, right? The, the, it's a total one-off question and someone asks a random question for a board meeting one day, but guess what? As soon as you produce it one time, you're now going to have to reproduce it and now that becomes operational. Uh, but where this is all going, and I think this is where I get excited is, and by the way, this, the asterisk here, it all starts with a solid foundation. So let's not forget that. You've got to go through the, the, the grind of getting things set up. It's all of these amazing technologies that are trying to process unstructured data. And that's where this is going. You need to answer your basic fundamental average deal size. Like you have to, right? Because someone on a board is used to seeing that. But where RevOps is going, one, it's, it is moving out of those basic support functions of just process information. Because let's face it, every single one of our computers and phones and think of all the apps, they process information faster than they can think about what we want to see next. That's where I see this going from anything and everything of you're recording a call. What is the sentiment and what is the value? What are the words they're saying? Why do they think this is important? I see a world that like no one inserts information into our CRM. Like that's like, that's where this is going, right? It's because guess what? It's your interpretation of how a phone call actually went. That hope is then usually prescribing a favorable opinion that for you, right? Cause you're trying to forecast it. How do you make sure you, but what was the real conversation, right? Close dates. I mean, how many times do you see a, a close date move in your CRM, right? What is the accuracy of that? We know if you're talking about X in this part of the sales cycle, you still have three months left, right? Yes, there's always bloomers that come up. So where I see revenue operations coming is one, it doesn't change those fundamentals that you need to build a good solid infrastructure. But that's where a CRM is continually growing towards a it's, it's almost a data warehouse more than anything. Yes, there's always human inputs and everything else on the way, but think of the ecosystem. Everything that you're buying is machine learning, AI, and all this. It's, it's real. And so that's where this is growing. And how quickly can us as revenue operations people get through the basics and getting that structure and getting that set up for board calls and all this stuff? Because really what's next is analyzing that unstructured information that we're still trying to figure out how to do it, right? There's no... like. If, if there's a great tool to do it, let me know. Um, but it's, well, it's truly my- <laughs> from a company-wide level. <laughs> <laughs> let me tell you about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Sounds pretty but, yeah, good. but that's exactly yeah. it, right? Like it, but it's at every level, right? And that's where, like, obviously, we're familiar with what y'all do. It's, it's at every level of the organization, right? We, we know we can look at this and, and trying to harness all of that unstructured data is absolutely where this world is going. I feel like you've described uh, a, a dream for so many different people in revenue yeah. operations, particularly you, Tony. <laughs> I'm just in awe right now. That's it. That's all I'm doing. <laughs> Please, to any salesperson listening to this, update your CRM. Um, <laughs> or, or find a tool that does it for you and make your life significantly yeah. easier. That's yeah, the way exactly. to go. Um, nice uh, Michael this has been wonderful um, it's yeah, been really great so to, to have you on the show and to learn a little bit more about you um, and, and really dig into kind of what you're what you're building at, at Castellon is there I didn't even mention this beforehand but is there anything that you'd like to sign off with a message that you'd like to send um, it, it's really about don't, don't be afraid to make mistakes I think is, is RevOps. And I think that's where 
the reason why RevOps is so fluid and we have podcasts like this is because we're trying to share knowledge. It's still a new job. Right? It's the same reason why some, what do you do? I work in RevOps. Well, what does that mean? And it takes an hour to like, explain to someone that's not in the business of RevOps. So I think it's really releasing some, some of the certain things, prioritizing where you need, make mistakes, and you're going to make a lot. I know every person in RevOps say, I shouldn't have done that, and I should have listened to that person. It's okay to do that and making sure that you're always, like your goal is to be that support function to really support the others around you. And don't forget that. Like that's super important. It's if if everyone else does well, like we do well at the same time. So that would be my sign off. That's beautiful. I think that's a life lesson for us all, to be honest. Make more mistakes and learn from it. Yeah, exactly. Amazing. Well, Michael, fantastic to have you on. Um, thank you everyone who has who has listened to this or will listen to this when it when it goes live. Um and uh, and we'll catch you next week for another episode. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much.